So here we are on Friday morning. I don't usually like Fridays. No, I do like Fridays actually, normally, but I like them even more because it gives me a chance to talk to my friend Pat McArt in Donegal. How are you this morning? Morning, Pat? morning, Jude. Nice to see you. Oh, all going well there. And I like your Gansey, whatever, wherever you got that one. Oh, that's what I wear all the time. It was just that last week I was, I did my midi uh, uh, impersonation. Uh, this uh, is my good. normal one. <laughs> Bits of food have been have been washed and scraped <laughs> off, it's, so it's yeah. now wearable again. <laughs> anyway, yeah. anyway, see you got rid of the fried egg, <laughs> <laughs> like likely fry. Anyway, uh, you know. more serious things. Um, a great man has left us, and the Daily Mirror, well, all the newspapers, not just the Daily Mirror, but the Daily Mirror's headline, I think it is Daily Mirror anyway, is uh, Maradona buried amid outpouring of grief in Argentina. So, do you, do you think he merited that outpouring of grief, Pat? Or I, I think he did, actually. Yeah. You know, so, you know so, I think in, in all life, all human life, we need heroes. We need something to, that we can aspire to. And, you know, I, I think, of all people, I thought one of the uh, people who summed it up best many years ago was Michael Parkinson, when he said, his idea of talent was somebody who could do something he couldn't. You know, he said he like somebody like sing like Frank Sinatra or Bing Crosby, paint like Picasso or Michelangelo or whatever. And he said so on. And like um, Diego Maradona was exceptional. Uh, I, I, I always say there's a sort of a pantheon as far as I can figure out, uh, you know, in, in football. Maradona, Pelle, George Best, Messi, Ronaldo. I think they're probably the five top players there's ever been um you know you, people can argue about other ones but th to me they were the top five and Diego Maradona possibly might have been the best like Jude let's get this clear in 1986 that was a pretty nondescript Argentinian team and he won the World Cup fund now I saw, I saw Peter Shelton English goalkeeper being uh, interviewed yesterday on Sky and he still hasn't got over the hand of God <laughs> 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 so uh, and um, I did a blog Gary, Gary Lineker, in fairness to him, has been far more generous than Gary was, in, you know, and, uh, and so on. But uh, I, you, no, I definitely think we, we, you know, so, when somebody brings so much joy and so much beauty and so much, have, and Mar Maradona did it, and it was, it was larger than life off the field as well. He didn't suffer fools gladly. I think he took a few pot shots at night, he could have been high on cocaine at the time at the media and all the rest. So he, he, was, he was absolutely special, and I, I think three days was very appropriate morning. Uh, I, I totally agree, actually. He's, uh, I think he's a great example of how football is actually art. You know, yeah. it's art. As much as ballet dancing or anything else, you know. It's, yeah. it's, uh, you, you said that, uh, who, who was it said that if they could do something that they couldn't do? Who did you? Michael Parkinson, Michael of Parkinson. all people. I, I don't yeah. agree with that. Uh, I mean, the point is, he didn't just play football, which I imagine Parkinson couldn't do either. Uh, yeah. He played football at a level that made it into something of great elegance and beauty. And people right. complain about footballers. I just get to my mic. People complain about footballers and say, oh, look at them, I've seen sums of money they're earning. Yeah. Listen, there are guys earning far more than them. And all they're doing is sitting in a mansion somewhere and getting stocks and shares shoved through the stock market. These, yeah. these guys, guys like Maradona, go onto the football field and they show us joy and beauty and ecstasy in ways yeah. that just, as you say, it uplifts the human spirit. Uh, yeah. it, there's a snobbishness that doesn't recognize this. Um, I remember when I was a kid, we used to have these essays. And I can't remember who, uh, you know, a book of essays by essayists from the 19th yeah. century and 20th century. And I'm not sure who it was. It might have been that guy from the north of England. But he did one. I remember the title of it was um, Football uh, in Terms of Ballet. And it was a description yeah. of a, foot, a kid yeah. watching a football game and thinking it looked like ballet dancers from the distance, yeah. you know? Yeah. And that's true. I mean, the way when they slow that down, especially that waltz he did. Ah, uh, yeah. Know, the, the, what, the, the, I remember reading shortly after, maybe about a month afterwards, they had actually um, um, movement professors or what I don't and they had engineers. Look, they thought it was nearly impossible 
for a human being to have that sort of balance because he was nearly uh, sort of like 45 degrees from the ground, uh, you know, like and, and still running. They, d they didn't think that was possible. You know, that's 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 a level of genius he was at. You know, uh, like 98, 99 percent of human beings would have fallen over. He didn't. You know, genius. Yeah, I agree. I think the fact he was quite short guy helped a lot. He was too. five very, foot five apparently. Uh, very stocky. Um, yeah. uh, and as a result, they, I suppose they say the low center of gravity. Um, but what about the way he le live, lived the rest of his life? I mean, well, no, before we do that, just briefly, what do you, you do you think the English are a wee bit hung up on, on that goal, the hand of God goal? A wee bit? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, dude, give us a break. <laughs> a wee bit? Uh, they, there's, it's the first thing come up when um, Maradona died. It was on the, you know, where uh, I think it was one of the Daily Star, the Sun. I can't remember which. Where was VAR when you needed it? You know, you know the, the, <laughs> and, uh, uh, the hand of God goal. It, it really, but you see, um, I think um, Diego, uh, the second goal. You know, whatever uh, justification they felt have been hard done by by the first goal. The second goal just blew it out of the water because that was a goal worthy of winning any game, any tournament, anything. It was so, such a superb goal. Yeah, I think of beauty and joy forever. But I, I wouldn't underestimate the first goal either. You know, I, I, I suspect... And the smallest man in the field was able to uh, jump the English <laughs> <and go -giver. laughs> right. And he did it in a way. He punched the ball, they say. And I think that's probably true. But he punched it with such skill that you never were uh, quite sure. It was like a... A conjurer, you know, you knew uh, well, he's pulling you, but God, how does he do it? I, I, I remember, Jude, the, the commentators didn't know it until they saw the reaction of the players That's and then they played it back, you know, right. on, on the initial commentary, they didn't see it. Jude, there's a great story. Ten years after he had retired, apparently he had uh, Maradona was standing talking to a reporter in a, in a big game and suddenly a ball came out of heaven and apparently with his ordinary shoes on, apparently... Maradona just turned and trapped the ball and somebody said it was the best bit of skill seen on that pitch all night and it was done by a wee fat man who was 10 years past his brain. You know, <laughs> that's the, le he had it, he, he just had that thing in him that yeah. you know, most human beings don't have. Yeah. Well, he follows a pattern though of great uh, soccer players uh, and maybe sportsmen generally in that if you think of George Best, you know, yeah. George Best was a great player and then he spent the rest of his life drinking and uh, Having Jude, there's a F. Scott Fitzgerald. I can never, I've never been able to find it since. He did, wrote a short story, and he tells a story about this um, American, either baseball player or football player, I can't remember now which. And he said, uh, after 32, the rest of his life was an anticlimax. You know, he was a great sports player, but and he got all the, uh, you know, the sort of adoration and all that. And the minute it stopped, the rest of his life was not, you know, he never got that again. And I think that's true of a lot of uh, sports people. Uh, that's right. The, the, the first troubles. That is the war, Tan War, or the War of Independence, you want to call it that. Liam yeah. O'Fuelon, the, the novelist, a short story yeah. writer, great, great writer, actually. Um, I remember reading his autobiography one time, and he, ta he talked about having been involved in the struggle, violence, conflict with the Brits. And he said that time was a, was a, a euphoric sort of time. Everything was yeah. so intense, and everything was so charged and alive. It was almost mm. almost ecstasy, he said. But it was a very poor preparation for the long humiliation of life. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's that's a good point. That's you know, that a point. very good point, isn't it? Yeah. There's also, I did a vlog of this this morning, and I remembered a poem that I used to teach called The Lesson of the Moth. So you, you yeah. got to go over to it after this, but essentially it's saying, which kind of life's the better? A life like our own, say, where we're more or less sensible and look after yeah. our health and so on. Or a life that says, here, give me the drugs, give me the sex. And yeah. the old joke about the guy coming into the room, George uh, Best. George Best. Where did it all go wrong, George? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. but you know what, it wasn't it Spartacus, the famous slave rebellion leader in Rome. He says, better today to live one day like a lion than many days like a, a lamb. You know, so... Well, the, the, the Republican cry used to be, um, you'd rather die on your feet than live on your knees. Uh, yeah. But the fact of the matter is, the great majority of us would rather live on our knees. Well, we would not rather live on our knees, but, you know, if we have yeah. to do that. Yeah, we, we, 
we would opt to do that if the, if the uh, circumstances uh, right. yeah, yeah, right. yeah. So it's, it's an interesting one, really. I mean, if you look at it, if you pull back, say, 100 years, right? 100 years yeah. hence, we'll all be dead. Yeah. Uh, so he went at 60. We might go at 80 or yeah, more deadly lucky 90. Uh, yeah. So so they're looking back and say, oh, well, he died that year. And that guy went got another tip. So what, like, was dead, you know? So. Uh, we're we're measuring out our lives, our lives in coffee spoons, as they say, whereas uh, yeah. uh, these guys are just embracing yeah. life. And, uh, even but wasn't there, wasn't there a great aptness? He, he died on, jo on, the, on the same date as George Best died as well. You know, the, did they really? Yeah, yeah, yeah I didn't he died. Know that. I didn't uh, whatever know that. it was, the was it in twenty fifth or something? Aye, yeah. whatever. No, uh, no I, 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 twenty fifth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very sad. so. So there's a great sort of symmetry in the world of two football geniuses dying on the same date. Yeah. yeah. We've also been, uh, I mean, we'll leave this now, but uh, I think we'll also have been um, uh, educated by the fact that the British went straight to the whole thing about the hand of God and forgot about all the wonder. Well, they didn't forget about it, but they grudgingly accepted that he got a second yeah. goal as well. Yeah. I think uh, it tells you something about English people. Also tells you something about Irish people. You know, the, the truth is, I don't know not a single Irish person that doesn't love to see England getting stuffed in a football game. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you, you agree? You, you, exactly, and you better join at home. Uh, the Scots, the Scots are worse than Irish. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> but, uh, I, 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 there's some of the Scots people I've met uh, in regard to England. Dude, when the England are playing, they they would nearly. Uh, I I have seen them and been in their company. They would vote for Russia against England rather than. You know, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Do you yeah. remember, I remember, what was it, in the 70s, now you, maybe you wouldn't remember this, but I was in England in the 70s, and um, they had on TV a friendly, I think it was a friendly between Scotland and England, <laughs> like a friendly between yeah. Scotland and England, and Scotland won it. And after uh, that, that was a home championship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, And after the guys dismantled the goalpost. Yeah, the goalpost, I remember it very well. Uh, yeah. I think that was the last home championship. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And I remember yeah. the commentator, there was a guy sitting on top of the crossbar. Which broke up and down until it broke. And the uh, guy saying, oh, I, I, that could be dangerous, uh, really. Somebody should give him a warning. <laughs> yeah. he, he was taking that goalpost home with him. <laughs> oh, it was great. It was great. Imagine, imagine getting on the train with that, dude. <laughs> uh, there's, yeah. nothing, there's nothing to beat a moment of uh, total joy. And you see it most yeah. frequently, I think, with football. And same with yeah. what we saw it with the Gaelic teams. We talked about this. Yeah. The, oh. the temporary team and the cabin team last week. So, uh, exactly. Uh, exactly. Never underestimate the joy of sport. Okay, yeah. let's go to something much more serious, which is a matter of, uh, this, this is an item from the Irish Times, and again, it's covered most of the papers. Uh, and Miriam Lord, who's a sort of a satirist um, yeah. on politics, has a heading, Helen McEntee holds up well for someone with barely a leg to stand on. You know something, I, I think, uh, one of the class lines, I actually wrote it down, uh, yeah, uh, after yesterday, I was listening to uh, one of the greatest strengths of the Irish judiciary is uh, the, that is that is uh, that is not uh, there's no political connections. <laughs> and as uh, you know, anybody that stands up and says that uh, uh, during a debate on the doll and says it with a straight face, you know, uh, I, I don't know. No, I don't who think that we're right. Remember who said it? Um, uh, no, what he, um, Hal McIntyre said it yesterday oh, during the during the debate. You know, and you, you sort of go, are you serious? The, the, real, the reality of all this is, right here, uh, for people who don't know, um, the Shimmers Wolf was appointed by Helen McEntee, who's the Minister for Justice, and there doesn't seem to be any process. Uh, there, were, there were five other judges who had, uh, had all uh, judicial experience, who apparently were interested in the position for the same Supreme Court. Uh, they, they were not appointed. Shimmers Wolf, who has never sat on the judicial bench in his life, uh, leapfrogged them all, and he was a, a Fun Gale appointed uh, Attorney General, and he now looks like he's a Fun Gale appointed uh, Supreme Court judge. But yeah, uh, but they're all denying us, and they're saying it, uh, he was the uh, Jab, which is a Judicial Appointments Board. Uh, yeah, they apparently nominated uh, Wolf, but apparently they weren't aware of anybody else looking for the job. So the whole thing is a, a mess. 
Um, but anyway, it seems like it's jobs for the boys, and uh, but uh, the government are denying it. Oh, Your turn. Yeah. They would do. They would do. Uh, I think they had a fight. Uh, actually, Miriam Lord says, you know, that when when McEntee appeared in the doll, she said that she is she was happy to be there. Uh, right. uh, but in fact, he says she says uh, if you looked outside, you would see the uh, guys filling in the two tracks where her heels were dug in the ground as she was pulled forcibly from Stephen's Green or somewhere down to yeah. the doll. Uh, that she was only Dude, like she's, been, she's, been avoid, she's been avoiding this for about three weeks. She absolutely what she said she was going to come in at quarter to ten on a Tuesday night, uh, and and and, and, uh, and you know, in other words, uh, she was avoiding it. She was she was had to be forced. She was dragged kicking and screaming and yesterday because the uh, all the oppositions were through from the business of the Doyle and they were saying they're taking it serious. What they were saying is basically, if she gets away with this, that a minister not being accountable to the Doyle, the next one's just going to pull the same stunt. Oh, yeah. And the, 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 But you know the funniest thing, dude, is they're all trying to say that uh, there was a process and there was a, there's, doesn't seem to be any process. This seems to be a straightforward Fine Gael appointment of, uh, and by the way, there was a guy called Colin Brophy on yesterday on RT, who's a fun deal TD. And I thought it was actually quite nasty. Uh, the guy, uh, Colin, uh, Carmichael O'Hara, who's the presenter, uh, started asking questions. And he says, Carmich uh, or he says to O'Hara, uh, Brophy, he says, you sh you're sounding like an opposition TD. What do, you, what do they think a job of a presenter is to do? But he asked the question. Mm -hmm. like they, like in other words, he, uh, he was trying to sort of saying, you know, um, a man doing his job was actually, you know, which was, I presume, deliberately designed to put, put him off, you know, uh, and so on. No, the, uh, it was, uh, it was a sort of, a, sort of a, a little insinuation, uh, you know, and I, I didn't like it. I thought it actually was quite nasty thing to do to a reporter doing his job. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's becoming a, fav a favorite attack. I mean, that's, that's the Trump line, isn't it? Yeah, I don't like yeah. your questions, the next person, you know. Um, uh, but I think there's several quite serious things in this. Uh, the first is, like, the only, only person we're told that she admitted enemy had suggested Wolf to her was Leo Varadkar. Yeah. Leo Varadkar. He, he, well, he, 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 she said, uh, he said to her that uh, he would make a good judge, I think. Uh, make yeah. a good judge. Yeah. And then she says, of course, that didn't influence my judgment. No. What? My bo my kidding? boss told my bo my boss told me that <laughs> uh, I I'm only in the job about a wet week. Uh, she was only in the job what well uh, what a couple of months. Yeah. Uh, she's no, she's never I don't know she's never sat on the bench. She, I don't think she's any judicial experience. She was wet behind the ears as a minister. Her boss mentions this guy who could be a, he thought would be a good judge, but he had no influence on her whatsoever. She made this decision totally on her own. Of course she did. <laughs> she she was asked, and I think this is the important thing. She was asked what criteria did she use? Yeah. And she says, oh, I use my judgment. Yeah. Well, I mean, you only can use your judgment using some kind of criteria. You might not yeah. be able to lay them out, but there are criteria you're using. I'd say high yeah. in her list of criteria was the fact that uh, her boss had said, hmm, I think that guy looks like a good judge. Uh, uh, well, uh, Jude, you got to ask yourself, if there's five judges, now I'm not having a go. Shim as well, apparently, is a very talented fellow. I'm a, very good brain and all so like that's that's a side issue but if there were five judges who have judicial experience who uh, maybe uh, well fitted for the job uh you know and they were passed over and Seamus Wolf got the job right there's a big question that it's, it was a political appointment now if that's the case let's get it out there but are we saying now that your political um, connections are more important than your ability to get a, a senior job in, a, on the judiciary in Ireland. Is that, is that the, the process we're now going through? That's the really big issue. I think that's, yeah, that's probably true. But even, uh, I mean, the Minister for Justice presumably has got the power. Did you say there's another body at the power to nominate him? A job, I, I, they can make recommendations. They can't appoint, it's the uh, Minister uh, makes the they, appointment. So, so it's the Minister of Justice makes the decision. Yeah. I, I just think it's scandalous. That a minister mm. of justice makes as important a decision as that, and you're not told the criteria that are being used. You know, I, I, she she talked as if it wasn't necessary to have a list of what the things were that she examined before she appointed them. She just said, you know, I use my solemn judgment. And uh, well, just just, June, uh, if, uh, if, uh, if a CEO of a big company gave a, uh, uh, an appointment, a senior appointment to his uh, 
uh, best friend's son or something, there's a fair chance that there would be a legal challenge to that, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and you know, by somebody claiming discrimination or something. But here we have a situation where uh, a job, uh, the highest job, basically, in land, the, the Supreme Court, and it's just there's no criteria. Uh, to use your term, no, there's no criteria or no criteria explained. There's no process that we can see. It's just the minister appointed. And by the way, it's, apparently, in, in, in previous uh, administrations, the minister, the Tisha, the Tanishta, and the leaders are always informed beforehand and agreed. Apparently, Michal Martin was only presented with one name and didn't know about the, the rest of it. Now, he, now he's going to have to sort of uh, stay stum, uh, or else that will come, come across as a complete, complete idiot. I wonder, um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm not sure that the opposition played the, the game as uh, well as they should have when they did cross-examine her. I, I, if I'd been there and I had been one of the, the opposition, I think that thing I really would have battened on to was, this is a ridiculous situation where somebody can make a judgment and just say, oh, well, I, I, I just thought he was the best. You know, right. you just, that wouldn't be, a, that certainly when I worked, for example, when we were taking students onto a course, we had to interview them, you had to have mm. criteria listed there. And you then yeah. had to sort of score them onto those. And if yeah. you didn't, you were in trouble. And I, in a way, I mean, I know there's a danger there, but the idea of just saying, oh, well, just see, see, see how you feel on the day, you know, do you like the look of them? Mm. That's, yeah. that's just a wee bit too subjective for my liking. Well, Brenton Howland, who's the former leader of the Labour Party, he yeah. was very good yesterday. I, I heard him and he was interviewed again this morning. Mm. And he's basically saying, like, this is a joke, you know. And he said he felt sorry for the minister because he said she literally didn't have a leg to stand on. Mm. And he said it would have been far better if had to come out and just said, look, this is straightforward political appointment. Uh, but I mean, if they want this change, are they going to take any steps or are they just going to go? Well, uh, there, there is a, a judicial uh, review committee, I think, uh, on yeah. the Doyle or some, uh, 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 I can't remember what it's called. It was, it's chaired by a Fianna Fáil guy in here. I've been interviewed yesterday. The, the, I'd say there's a fair chance they're now going to have a look at this because, yeah. you know, you just how does somebody go from Attorney General to the Supreme Court and have never sat on the bench in their life? You know, yeah. you yeah. sort of have to ask, what was the criteria and what's the process that can... Dude, this is not an appointment for somebody sweeping the street. This is the guy who can actually affect, uh, his judgments can affect our, all our lives, you know. Yeah. And, it's, yeah. and it, you know, at the very least, you would hope to have some sort of, uh, uh, sort of faith in their, uh, you know, their ability to do the job properly. Yeah, but you see, the, their, their colleagues on the, on the Supreme... His colleagues on the Supreme Court don't seem to have much faith in him. Because they, no. they were in favour of not being returned to the Supreme Court after the yeah. attack on Golfgate. And I mean, uh, Golfgate does indicate a guy whose judgment, shall we say, is uh, very shaky. Uh, a poor <laughs> wolf must be, must be feeling, what, what have I done in a previous life to deserve all? <laughs> he, 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 well, at one stage, he was heading straight to the Supreme Court and no yeah. after. Along yeah. comes Golfgate and now this. <laughs> well, if he's, if he's capable of making a mistake like Golfgate, I think he deserves everything he gets or doesn't get, yeah. as the case may be. <laughs> okay, let's go on to number three then, and that is this question of the Oxford vaccine and the shadow yeah. that's come over. As you remember, the Oxford AstraZeneca um, vaccine was uh, announced the other day there, and yeah. there was a lot of hope for it. They were pointing out that the, the, the rate of success was 70% or something under it, uh, but for, when they uh, injected people twice, but when they give a short half injection the first time and a full injection the second time, that went right up to 90%. But yeah. now people are saying that, uh, especially, especially, you notice, um, people in the States are saying that's not good enough, uh, that there was only a small, something like two and a half thousand people who were given the half yeah. dose and the full dose, and they, you know, they, they couldn't accept that. I, I, I think I think, was, I think we're still looking after their own ends. Uh, I, but you, I think there was one point, a point that I, I remember, they, they said, um, no one, I think in this, uh, one of the trials, there was no no one above the age of 55 uh, 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 given, given the second dose. So, mm. uh, and, and like, so there's a fair chance it would be 90% effective, uh, you know, under 55, because, mm. uh, you know, if you just be, being fitter and all the rest of it and being younger. Yeah. So that, but there, but there's, uh, I think, um, what do you call them, AstraZeneca, they're saying uh, this is actually, they're going to go for another trial just to prove the point. They're saying on phase two, uh, the uh, vaccine was actually very effective uh, with elderly people. 
Uh, so they, they said they're only going to do this trial to prove whatever yeah. uh, results they got. So, well, I, uh, but, I, uh, but it, I think I think if the, the, what they uh, when they reviewed people went through it and said, wait a minute, there's nobody above the age of 55 in this 90% category, success category. So you know, that was the issue. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's fair enough, actually, and they probably should do it, uh, especially speaking as somebody mm -hmm. over 55. Uh, I think it's a good idea and, and, you know, check that out. But yeah. I, I, I'm terribly suspicious. Maybe I'm just a, a conspiracy theorist. But you see, Pfizer and Moderna, both of their, all of their shots cost something like 20 or yeah. more dollars a shot. Yeah. AstraZeneca yeah. is something like $2 or $3 a yeah. shot. And yeah. what's more, they have said they'll sell it at cost throughout the world because they're very yeah. concerned about poor countries. I yeah. can't, I, is that fit? There's a, I'm a suspicious person, I suppose. But the fact of the matter is, if they could discredit the Oxford vaccine or yeah. make them go back and take a long time doing more trials, these mm. guys could flood the market with their stuff. And, you know, people aren't going to wait. People are given a choice, you know, I have to pay through mm. the nose for this, but it might save my life. Or yeah. I'll wait and get, you know, uh, something at a cheaper price in a couple of months' time. But I might be dead yeah. by then. So yeah. I think there's big pharma's uh, flexing its muscles and seeing if it can block this this uh, upstart that's going to uh, actually benefit humanity. Yeah, well, you, uh, you can't. A big pharma hasn't had a great track record when it comes to morality. You know, oh. they've done uh, in the past. They've done some terrible things. Mm -hmm. So I, I can't turn around and say I, d I disagree with you because that's quite possible that they're that. Though I do think they have left them, themselves open. And apparently it's some sort of peer review type thing. Yeah. And someone, somebody went through it and said, well, well look, here's the problem about the, and the, where there's the 95% or the 90% success rate. There was nobody over the age of 55 in that particular uh, cohort of people. Yeah. So, you know, on, on, until you've tried, tried it out on the maybe over the over 75s or whatever and how effective it was, what is the efficacy of it with them, you know, yeah. Your your results need uh, some need some sort of caveat, but yeah. having said that, should uh, they they had themselves said that in the phase two they used uh, the trials uh, it was very successful. So maybe I'll take another month to get that out of the way, and that's it then. Uh, See, but that's a long time, uh, yeah. given the fact that you know countries are ordering the vaccine, yeah. they're ordering from Pfizer, they're ordering from Moderna. Uh, there's a danger that we could squeeze out. I tell you the last thing I'll say that. Is, um, well, I'm very much in favor of the, the I hope that the Oxford uh, AstraZeneca one is successful, but um, I'm a bit surprised that the only is discovered by accident that taking a half dose and then a full dose was 90% uh, effective. They yeah. stumbled on it. So they didn't, yeah. didn't, they, they, nobody, it's funny, you'd think that that'd be a very obvious thing, wouldn't it? You know. Less well, like uh, that, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be obvious to me because I wouldn't, wouldn't know. I, but on the other hand, you know, you stop to think you're saying, well, what's the best way to work this out? You'd be trying out all the angles, and that seems a pretty obvious angle, I think. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, um, if it was, uh, if they were giving it to pe people, well, why did they have to give it to a group? Even they thought it was a full dose. Uh, why would they give yeah. them to a group that were only under fifty-five? Yeah. Uh, but you, but you know, I, I remember, I, I'm not 100% certain of this, but I remember watching years ago a program about the, the guys who did research into diabetes. And I think one of them did something stupid in the lab one day and suddenly, wait a minute, look at the results. What did we do there? You know, that type of thing. You know. yeah. So uh, you, um, sometimes uh, I think uh, scientific cures, okay, there's a lot of hard work for inspiration, inspiration, but there's also sometimes a wee bit of luck in there. I, somebody said somebody used the word serendipity. I think from Oxford actually. Yeah. So it's yeah. Serendipity, like just just got lucky, and and yeah. Right, I'm delighted with that lucky. But as I say, I'm still very suspect of these bloody people from uh, the states and uh, they're big. But you know, I would I think, say a lot of people are still go ahead with and buy the oh, Oxford one I mean, on, on 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 the basis that one. Uh, you know, all they're waiting for is a test. Uh, they, 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 they've already proved the efficacy of it, so you know it's only now. Uh, uh, but as you say, you figured but, the ones, well, I think I think the uh, what is, I'm not what, the Pfizer one. Uh, it's massive. Pro there's a massive problem there. You have to store it at something like se minus oh, seventy or something. Uh, like Jesus, well, where where do you find minus seventy even in Ireland? But yeah, that, yeah. Like I, I had a friend from Australia on this morning. He sent me something on uh, social media. It's, and South Australia today is 40 degrees plus. Oh. <laughs> where, where do you find somewhere to store Pfizer's minus uh, 70? 
Well, I suppose if a population is desperate enough, they'll find ways of constructing a deep storage thing that they can yeah. shove around. But uh, anyway, it, I, I see it as a, I'm sure I'm being simple-minded, but I see it as a struggle between um, sort of philanthropy or humanity yeah. and yeah. big pharma. And I know who said yeah. that one. Anyway, uh, yes. you ever thought of an interscient yourself, Pat? No, no, my knowledge of science is zero. I'll leave you with this. The, uh, when Volvo, when they, they were the people, they, they know the Volvo, they, they were big into road safety long before anybody else. When they uh, discovered you know, the three point lock, you know, on your seatbelt, rather than keeping it to themselves, they gave it out to all other car manufacturers in the world on the basis that they said this will save lives. And they did it for free, you know. Leave you with that thought. Fair play to them. Fair play to them. Yeah. Well, I I just leave you with this. I could have become a great scientist, except that I, whenever we had to take notes in the class, that science class, and then we had to take them home or to the study hall and underline the important bits in red ink. And yeah. I, on several occasions, smudged the red ink. And that's yeah. why I didn't become a great scientist. Uh, I knew the it, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, but in my, in my case, it was just stupidity. Right? <laughs> well, it was a bit of that. Good in luck. my case, too. Okay, but thanks very much. Thanks, dude. Good luck. All the best, Dave.